Great. Well, welcome everybody. I know there's a few people just um, just still joining us and coming through in from the lobby, but uh, we'll get we'll get started. Uh, so yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. So this is now uh, fourth in a series of webinars that we've been hosting, um, designed to help you. Um, think a little bit differently and, and tap into powerful capabilities from Microsoft uh, around the area of compliance and their purview offerings, um, really to help kind of reduce risk and improve the way that, that you're managing life cycle of content as it moves through Microsoft 365. So e-discovery is um, the hot topic for today, and it's a topic that we love to talk about. It's very much part of the roots of our business, um, where we've delivered e-discovery solutions in various different forms over the past uh, two decades, really sort of moving in various waves of technologies as they have uh, evolved over time. So our guest speakers today are David and Adam from Salient e-discovery, who are actually a, a sister company to Cloud Essentials, and our worlds are very intertwined. Um, David and Adam lead a team of very experienced e-discovery and forensics specialists and they are going to take us on a, a journey today through the Microsoft 365 stack of solutions from content search to standard to premium offerings and uh, yeah just guide us through those and inspire us I suppose with some examples of, of how to uh, be more successful with those tools and how to guess um, best value for money um, from your investment in those tools. So the format for today is uh, a presentation, a mix of information and advice, um, some demonstrations um, where we'll mute for the delivery of that content and then we're going to lift um, to unmute and we'll stop the recording and have a bit more of an open forum where you can bring some some questions, um, some feedback and any uh, comments you'd like to make on, on what's discussed. So for those who don't already know of, of Cloud Essentials and Salient, just um, some very quick sort of background context. So Cloud Essentials are a very uh, active Microsoft partner around the area of content management. So we help organizations bring content into Microsoft 365, help find uh, a rightful home for it within Microsoft 365 ecosystem and handle a lot of uh, complexity around that transition of content into the environment, but also really helping establish a foundation of compliance and security controls um, and get on more of a sustainable journey around the people and the process and the technology around that kind of foundation of controls and maturing that over time. And overall, yeah, reducing the, the, the risk profile of your content in Microsoft environment um, as it grows uh, in volume and, and grows as you collaborate and tap into more of the tools in Microsoft 365. And ultimately, you know, opening up the value of that content so that you can start to do much more sophisticated things um, with it and, and surface that content to your business advantage. So our colleagues at Salient Discovery are our, uh, our deep, forensics analytics and e-discovery arm of our business and they work with organizations to to support e-discovery responses and investigations to host e-discovery platform and, and deliver a lot of processing work in a very cost efficient way um, working with various ai technologies around the world of, of e-discovery so that's why they're here today um, to host this session for us and, and sort of champion those elements of e-discovery within Microsoft 365 as we have sort of wandered around the, the Microsoft um, compliance offerings over the past few months in this series of webinars. So if you missed previous webinars, we've got a link, uh, we'll put it in our chat and in follow up um, email to you so you can catch up on those presentations. And next month we'll be looking at um, lifecycle management and managing retention policies and that kind of thing. So I'm going to hand over um, to, to David and Adam uh, to, to walk us through. Well, thanks very much for the uh, the positioning, Laura. Uh, and yes, as, as you've mentioned today, we, you know, we'd like to expand on the added value potential that having your corporate data within the Microsoft 365 platform uh, opens up to you. So uh, and, and, and as you say, I think you mentioned that we're passionate about uh, about this subject, you know, connecting information governance with 
preparedness uh, you know, is really sort of uh, our area, very specific to, to e-discovery. Um, and you know, we, we all know that investigations are, you know, they're, they're, they're generally expensive uh, and they generally are a necessary evil. They typically add little or no intrinsic value to an organization. So, you know, they can be very stressful as well. So, you know, there's, there's no getting away from the fact that organizations you know, such as law firms and indeed ourselves are you know, fairly parasitic on the problem. Um, as I say, stressful, you know, they often require urgent uh, responses um, and, you know, sometimes that's to avoid penalties or maybe sanctions. Uh, and the sense of urgency can also transfer to ourselves. You know, we're, we're usually at the very end of the chain. And so, you know, we're picking up the problems and, and needing to uh, needing to respond in a very timely fashion. So there's enough challenges in our day to day lives. In, in running businesses so that there, there must be a better way and, and you know frankly sort of our mission is to help our clients find that better way you know it, it may sound a little counterintuitive that you know we're trying to sort of help our clients you know, use us less but if effectively by by working in that way and in partnership with clients we find that we can help them reduce cost and stress and we all benefit in the long run so what what is that better way? Well, I, I generally rely on Mark Twain for a quote in this space, uh, but you know the, the key to this really is around preparedness. You know, so getting your house in order, knowing where your data is, knowing how you're going to respond to problems ahead of time, very very important uh, for, from any discovery perspective. But also, it, it's the sort of learning from your mistakes angle as well. You know. Let's face it, it's common sense, but the reality is, if we're honest with ourselves, we probably don't always do that. So I think it's very important to sort of take those actionable insights from every every uh, case that you, you're involved in and to learn from them and not repeat those same errors. And I guess the segue really into what we're talking about today is, is to, to explore to what extent you may have technology at your disposal that you can use in-house to sort of you know, to, to assist, sort of help you sort of, uh, you know, get some fewer sleepless nights as you go through. You know? So as I say, that's the sort of the logical segue into uh, into the purview product, which we're, we're going to talk about in more depth today. Uh, but first of all, we'd like to sort of kick off with a, a bit of a poll. So hopefully we're going to have a poll popping up in the uh, in the chat panel. Um, and you know, we want to try and understand to what extent uh, you know, or, or how your organization is currently satisfying e-discovery requirements at present. So I'll just give you a few seconds to uh, you know, to submit some answers. A few more, few more seconds. Okay, so it 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 would appear that you know um, it's a combination between entirely in house and you know responding on a hybrid basis so using using outsourced uh, either legal firms or i guess um, legal service provide, uh, providers combined with your in-house capabilities so that's you know it doesn't come as a massive shock to me but uh, makes sense okay well what what i wanted to do was first of all sort of look at the problem in in the context of of what we call the EDRM the electronic discovery reference model uh, and you may well be familiar with this it's a, a pretty well established and structured journey through through the logical steps to any investigation or or litigation event so you know the idea being as you journey from left to right the volume of data being considered reduces whilst at the same time the relevance of that which remains becomes greater and you can see here where microsoft positions uh, itself within that journey, um, you know, in terms of both the the purview standard and and premium premium offerings, and you know the the premium offering, you know, is shown to cover quite a large amount of that overall journey. But uh, you know, whilst you know, the the reality is that uh, there are some limitations to to what is being offered um, from from Microsoft. I mean, firstly, um, it's fair to say that the review element of the product is not a fully featured um, re review tool. It's very good and it may well develop into that in time, but at present it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's a good way there. But the second point is that, you know, really it's, it's that it's primarily for Microsoft eco, uh, sort of ecosystem content, you know, that there are connectors into third party content, but it's not as extensive as as, uh, as a traditional e-discovery product would would offer you. But uh, you know that that's that's okay. But there are sort of examples where you know your legacy data may not be in a 365 platform, or there are you know, business systems which are never going to be in, in in a 365 platform. So you need to be able to cater for those as well. So um, you know, being be, being able to cater for those and also the sort of the downstream elements of uh, you know, producing data in court ready 
um, format for for courts is an area where there is you know, some overlap. So, um, you know, but it's fair to say that e even if you're integrating with with third party solutions downstream, there is certainly a lot of value to be added from using the the in place capability that uh, the uh, the three six five purview options provide. Looking at that first sort of little left hand innocuous box on the end about information governance, you know, we we as we say are about driving out the costs from the whole e-discovery process and you know that first element is to do with information governance but if you look into that in 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 more detail there are a world of things in there that you need to consider you know i'm sure those of you who've attended previous webinars in, in in the cloud essential series will have you know be familiar with issues around you know classification and security and so on and i know there's a future session planned on data life cycle and you know, retention manage, management so you know e-discovery is, is kind of a practical example of where improved information governance rubber really hits the road you know understanding your data estate understanding where that information is understanding the lineage you know what has created that data um, and the classifications and security and so on so they're, they're all aspects that the broader 365 platform very ably assists with the second element where we see opportunities to drive out the cost is, is frankly is knowing what you're going to be doing you know, the process understanding you know, is there a, a documented process? Who owns it? And more to the point, who is responsible for delivering on that? You know, is it legal? Is it IT? Is it compliance? You know, a combination, undoubtedly. And the same with the delivery, you know, actually the practical delivery of what you need to do. Who is responsible for that? And and frankly, it's it's likely to be an element of in-house and outsource, as as we saw in the in the poll there. So, you know, um, important to understand, you know, what's going on there on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and finally, the other element, you know, obviously the uh, the, the subject of today's uh, session is around technology. So, you know, you may well have tools at your disposal that could help you to a greater extent than, than you think. And the, the, the key bit here is that, you know, e-discovery technologies traditionally are what's called lift and shift. So you have to move the data from the source to the platform, the e-discovery platform to, to then perform actions on it. Now, Purview gives you in-place e-discovery and, you know, it helps you to sort of, the whole concept of supporting the identification, the preservation, the collection of data all in one, which is kind of the holy grail. You know, we understand that not all of your data will live in 365, but uh, certainly a significant chunk of it will do these days. So, uh, you know, using that tooling is is uh, pretty key in, in driving the costs out. So I'm going to hand, hand over to Adam. But before we do so, I think we've got a second poll, which is around really trying to understand the extent to which you're currently using the Microsoft Purview tools or not. So hopefully that's been loaded into the chat and we'll be able to see that now and uh, to what extent you are you are using it. So we, we'd be interested to see uh, you know, the, re the, the responses on that. And then Adam's going to comment on, on what we see. Thanks, David. Let's have a quick look at the results. So most of the results are yes, partially, 67% um, and some people are not, uh, know but are aware of the capabilities and the others don't uh, have any knowledge. So that's that's a good mix. So I imagine those that are saying yes, partially probably use some aspects. Um, so what I hope to show is a broad cross section of the capabilities um, and hopefully that you find that informative. So I'm just gonna share my my screen quickly. Okay, let me know if you can see it. Yep. Great. Well, thanks, thanks, David, and welcome everyone. Um, so, before diving into the various purview e-discovery options, um, I just wanted to quickly run through some of the e-discovery roles and permissions in uh, Microsoft 365 with respect to e-discovery. And also, just to caveat, I'm not doing a deep dive in in each aspect, be it content search. Um, standard and um, preview um, the the advanced e-discovery. Um, I'm going to go through all three of them and, and then just give you the strengths and weaknesses of each and, and the functionality with each. So access to e-discovery cases is done via the assignment of roles. Um, and this is done in the purview compliance portal under permissions. And there's two, broadly speaking, two roles. The first being an e-discovery manager role, which allows um, you to create a content search and also view and manage e-discovery cases that you are a member of as an e-discovery manager. 
in a higher, um, a more elevated role as that of an e-discovery administrator, which can perform all the case management tasks uh, that an e-discovery manager can, can do. They are also able to view all cases, manage any case after they add themselves as a member to that case, export data for any e-discovery case and remove members from a case. It's just an overview of the roles. So I'll dive into content search first of all. So it's a more simplistic um, e-discovery tool within Purview. So essentially it gives you the ability to search and export content in Microsoft 365. And to do so and use it, you must be a member of the e-discovery manager role group. And our, gives you the ability to search various locations such as Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, OneDrive, uh, Microsoft Teams, Microsoft 365 Groups, Yammer Groups, and public folders. Um, it's also good to know that it supports double byte, char double, double byte character set languages, commonly known as the CJK la languages, that's Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. So when doing keyword searches, for example, you can set those a uh, language type. Um, and the limitations with um, content search is that there, are, there is no legal hold, nor adv no advanced indexing. And I'll come back to the indexing a little further on, but it's an important point to note. So with the uh, eDiscovery standard, um, eDiscovery standard extends the content search with the case creation and eDiscovery hold functionality. So you can search the same locations as content search. However, the workflow is a little bit different. Um, the first the first aspect would be to or step would be create a hold, then search for content, and then you can export and download your search results. So I'm just going to start the video and run through it. So as you can see, it's under eDiscovery standard in the purview um, portal, compliance portal. So I'm going to first create a hold. I already had one set up, but what I'm going to do is edit it and add a location or another custodian. So I have Stuart added already, but I'm going to add Dean and his exchange mailbox to the hold. At the same time, I can add a SharePoint site. So you can see I'm going to search for legal and compliance SharePoint site, and I can also add that to the hold. I could also add public folders if I liked, and I can refine that by running a query for keywords, for example, or particular criteria like to, from, dates, and so forth, and that would refine the hold. So notes on hold is that it, it preserves content until it's removed and supersedes any retention or deletion policies that might be in place within Microsoft 365. And as you notice, we have two options. So you could place all content in a specific location on hold or only content that matches a search query on hold. Now, within the standard, I'm gonna um, go through how we do a search and search those locations on hold. So, I'm going to create a new search. You can give it a friendly name. And I can choose various locations, but I'm going to choose the locations I've already put on hold. You can see I have a radio button locations on hold. And then there's a tick box for content for on-premise users. Um, so you can't search emails on-premise, but you can search team chats. And here I'm going to add and cheat and add a query to add some keywords to my search conditions. You can see I've added three phrases there. You can add 20 phrases in that grid view. And then I'm going to refine it by type of documents. I'm going to look at email messages, documents, and instant messages. But again, I can add other contents such as senders, subjects, titles, and, and dates. And then submit that search. So I've now submitted the search. Just to go back to that checkbox, so in an exchange hybrid deployment, you can't search emails in on-premise mailboxes, but you can search team chat data because that's using uses a cloud-based storage area. So then once you've done your search, you wait for the search to complete. You could go through and review those searches if you need, need to and look at a sample, or you can then export them in various formats. So 
I'm just going to run through that so you can see the search is now completed. Then I could click on it and say, well, I could review a sample of the documents, the 181 items, but in this case, I'm going to just export the results. And you have various options here to output. So you can output all items excluded, unrecognizing, unrecognized format, encrypted, or items that weren't indexed. So or you could do all items and those that were unrecognized, encrypted, or not indexed, or only items that were unrecognized, encrypted, or not indexed. I'll come back to those shortly. Usually we choose the second option where I am at the moment. Check there. So you can, when you export exchange content, you have one PSD for each, mail, each mailbox or one PSD containing all the messages for all custodians, or one PSD file containing all the messages in a single folder or individual messages in MSG format. You can deduplicate all that content. You can also include versions for SharePoint files and you can export them into a zip folder if you like. And that's the estimated export of 181 results. So when you close a case uh, in standard e-discovery or e-discovery standard and premium, all holds are removed, um, but a 30 day grace period applies called a delay hold and it's applied to all content locations that were on hold. Only holds associated with the case are removed. Litig litigation holds and retention holds and holds from other cases still apply. So the limitations of e-discovery standard is there's no advanced indexing, no machine learning capability, and no ability to add non-Microsoft 365 content. Um, that advanced indexing is important. So when you do searches in e-discovery standard and content search, you're really using the Office 365 search index. And not everything might be indexed in that, be in that um, index. For example, the image only PDF would not be indexed. So those, those were those options earlier where you could export items that weren't indexed, for example. So when running keywords, you might not get the true hits of everything you're looking for in that respect. So eDiscovery Premium, just a quick overview, it has intelligent machine learning capabilities such as deep indexing, email threading, near duplicate detection, and helps you reduce large volumes of data to a relevant data set. You can also enable an attorney client privilege model, uh, which when run, when you use the analyzed data, which runs when you analyze data in a review set. It also reconstructs team conversations. So you might get a hit on a particular message, but in premium, you can reconstruct the team conversation and identify contextual content. It also allows you to collect cloud-based content shared by users by means of links in emails and Teams chats. It has built-in support for hundreds of non-Microsoft 365 file types. And as David mentioned, you can collect data from third-party sources such as Slack, Bloomberg, Reuters, Facebook for Business, and even on-prem Windows file shares. In both standard and premium, you have the ability to set up compliance boundaries, which are logical boundaries within which your discovery managers can search. So you can compartmentalize what they have access to. Um, so I'm going to go through the how we create a case in eDiscovery Premium. Um, and uh, let me just kick that off. So it's also in the purview compliance portal under eDiscovery Premium. I'm going to set on, turn on the attorney client privilege detection. I could upload a list of attorney email addresses to help with that detection. And I'm going to create a case. So when I create the case, I also have some options then to set up access to that case, as well as setting some of the search and analytics functionality on the case. Just wait for that to run. So I can set up the access and permissions. So you can see that I can add e or e-discovery managers within my tenant to it, to this case.
And then I can configure the search and analytics. So here you can set up near duplicates and email threading parameters, enable themes for to group similar documents together, auto create a deduplicated review set for review, which is very useful. Um, you can also set up ignore text parameters, so identify lengthy disclaimers to ignore during the analytics like near duplicates, threading and themes and relevance, and also enable OCR, either low or high accuracy to OCR content during deep indexing. The next step is to add custodial and non-custodial data sources to your eDiscovery Premium case. So when you add a new custodian, the mailbox and OneDrive account are selected by default. So you'll see when I select Dean, you'll see that those are selected by default, but I can add other locations such as mailboxes, SharePoint and Teams that he might be a member of. And I can then also place his data on hold. This preserves the data that may be relevant to the case. I can also then go and add non-custodial data sources. So let's go and add that SharePoint site legal and compliance. And that will also be placed on hold. So I've added two custodians and a non-custodial data source to my data sources for this case. So as I mentioned, in content search and e-discovery standard, the Microsoft 365 index is utilized. And this is in, as it's really intended, as it is really intended for end user search and not e-discovery searching, there might be items that aren't indexed. In e-discovery premium, custodian data is re-indexed including partially indexed items and any indexing errors by a process called advanced indexing, and this helps optimize search. And after advanced indexing, the reprocessed content is then stored in a hybrid index for searching. The next step would be to create a collection. So this is, allows you to apply keyword searches and other criteria to those um, data sources, custodial and non-custodial. So you can see that the indexing was successful on those three data sources. So now I'm going to go and create a new collection. And I'm just going to add the custodial data sources, data sources. I can just select all. In this case, I'm just going to show you that I can select individual ones. So the two individuals, you can see it was their mailbox and their OneDrive. And now I'm going to add their non-custodial non data source being the legal and compliance. I can then add any additional locations I might want to at this point, or I can proceed and add the conditions such as keywords and other parameters that I want to search this or filter this data by. I'm going to cheat again and just put in that phrase. You'll notice here that I now have 180 rows of keywords that I can add instead of 20 standard, and I can add those additional parameters. The collection then can be saved as a draft, in which case you have the ability to review the co collection statistics, or it could be added to a new review set or an existing review set, various settings. In this case, we're just going to add it to a draft, so we can then view some of the content or sample some of it and refine it if necessary. And this way you can collect up to one terabyte of data in a single collection. So you'll notice here that the estimated the state, the estimate status is successful and the preview status is successful. Um, so we can preview the results and commit this to a review set. A number of steps you have to follow in the premium, but it's all logically laid out. So you get some idea of how many items you found and in which locations. Then you can have a summary and now we're going to edit the collection and commit it to a review set. So I just move through that wizard again and at the end I'm going to commit it. And you'll see that the contextual team chats around your search are collected automatically as are cloud attachments found in your search results. But you have the option to add partially indexed items to your search results and versions of SharePoint items and add that to the review set and then can submit.
So a quick brief um, background and review sets. So these are sets of static documents in the case where you can analyze query review and tag documents and export the case data. You can add non Microsoft 365 content to the case at this point, but this content must be associated or assigned to a custodian. So it could be content from their laptop, for example, and it can include Microsoft Office files, container files such as zip files, PSDs, inbox message files. I also want to mention that two special queries are created when you create a review set. So there's one called potentially immaterial items, which are items such as zip files, PST, inboxes that couldn't be expanded, and images less than three kilobytes. So that's items that you might want to exclude from your view. And it also helps you um, by setting up a for, a for reviews um, query, which excludes those immaterial items and contains only items that are representative, unique, and inclusive in the review set. So you can focus in on those. And it supports again one terabyte of pre expansion content. So I'm going to run through a review set. We're going to show how we can do some queries and filters, preview some items, tag some documents, and then uh, also how we can import non Office 365 data. So, first of all, I'm going to apply some filters to the review set. So, you have many options here there's the keyword filter as well as item properties, which are extensive. I've included about five or six here, which are across the top. And then, then going to <clears throat> run a keyword like discovery, hit enter to search for that. So it brings back those search results, items, 85 items. And I can save that as a query saying this as discovery query. So that query will be persistent in the case. And if you look at the save filter queries, you will see I have a number of safe queries there for regulatory discovery, e-discovery, and those for review potentially immaterial items I referred to earlier. I can select an item and preview it. I can see the source text, also plain text view or a metadata view of the item. I also, the analytics has picked up that it has three family members. It's in a conversation of six threads and has three near duplicates. I can also annotate and redact content. So you can see here, I'll put it on see-through uh, mode at the moment. I can move to another item, navigate down. I'd already, I had redacted something on here, but I can redact something else. So I might wanna redact this area. It's quite straightforward to do. And these redactions can then be burnt into PDFs when you do your production. So when you produce the native, it actually produces a redacted PDF. You can also move from the small window, expand the window out into a larger view, navigate through them, the items, and you can also tag. So you know, I can select that item and tag it as responsive or non-responsive. Move through some items. So I'm going to tag responsive. I can do that individually, or if I run a query or a search, I can do a bulk tag. So I can select these items here and go to tag files and tag those hundred I selected or and tag the entire result set from a search. So you use the tags to call unnecessary content, identify relevant content or privileged content. You can also manage non Office 365 data. So some, something about caveats around this is that all files must be in a folder associated with a specific custodian with the name using the following format, alias and domain name, which must be the user's Microsoft 365 alias and domain. And you must also have the AZ copy tool installed on a computer that has access to that content in the folder structure. Using the AZ copy, you can copy that up into Microsoft 365 it will be indexed and processed against your custodian and then searchable. Okay. So also in the premium uh, e-discovery tool, we have predictive coding um, or technology system review. And this can be used to prioritize documents for review based on your tagging decisions. Some of the 
requirements there is that you must have at least 2,000 items in the re review set to create a model. And relevancy is based purely on the content of the item and not of the item's metadata. So you train the model by going through rounds of training where it randomly selects 50 items at a time. And during the process, the model evaluates your decision making and applies a prediction score to all items in the case. So in this screenshot, I've gone through two rounds of training of 50 items each, and I'm about to start a third round of training. And between rounds of training, the model calculates a number of metrics. I won't cover all of them now, because they get quite complex, but probably the most important one is something called recall, circled in red here. So recall is the proportion of items uh, that the model predicted were relevant from items that you actually tagged relevant in the training. So 80% of those that I tagged relevant, the model agreed with me. So a score closer to one indicates the model will identify more relevant items, so one or 100%. So when going through the predictive coding, you can perform additional rounds of training to increase the accuracy of the model and increase the recall rate until your model stabilizes. So it's considered stable when the overturn rate between training rounds drops less than to less than 5%. So at the moment, between rounds, 48% of the items are having their prediction score trained or changed, sorry. So we still have some way to go. Um, and then once you've done this between training rounds and when the model might be stabilized, you can apply a prediction score filter in review to display only the items that the model has determined are most relevant. In general, items with scores above 0.5 or 50% and 1 or 100% are considered relevant. So I'm just going to go through and show you how we can train a predictive model and then how you can rank the documents using a prediction score. So I have a model set up already. As you see, I'm in round three. There's some of the parameters you saw in the earlier, earlier screenshot. Um, the precision has moved from 40 to 50% between the two rounds and recall from 66 to 80% in the first two rounds. So I'm going to start a training round. I select an item. I can then just preview the item and tag it as relevant or not relevant. In that case, it was not relevant. The ability to auto move to the next item would be a great addition, but you have to click and select the item or the arrow to move between items. I'm going to say this one is relevant and so on and you go through these 50 items and when you're done and check them in then the model and algorithm will recalculate the prediction scores so going back to the review set you see i have a prediction score column i'm going to apply a filter of prediction score of 0.5 responsiveness score of 0.5 to 1 so these would be the items after these rounds of training that are deemed most likely relevant based on my responses to the model. I can then search or filter them or sorry, sort them and then look at the most highly ranked items for relevance and tag them as well. So the objective of the predictive coding is to rank documents based on user decisions so they can be prioritized. Uh, for review, and depending on the number of lines of inquiry in your case, you may want to set up more than one predictive model. And model building is a very much an iterative process, and each model should be as narrowly defined as possible so it can stabilize as quickly as possible. For example, you might have a bribery issue in a case and an accounting issue, and therefore you could possibly set up two models and train them independently. I also wanted to cover in premium the export because it's a little different from standard. So here you can export 5 million documents or 500 gigs of data, whichever is smaller. So you can export reports only, which is really a load file and a summary of the content of what was uh, found or exported. And the load file contains metadata relating to that content. Then you could also have an option to ex export loose files and PSDs. One caveat around this option is that redacted PDFs can't be included in this option. You have a folder which contains all content from Exchange stored in PST files. 
you have a folder containing all native content from SharePoint in native file format, and an imported data folder containing non-Microsoft 365 native content. The one that is selected here is condensed directory structure, which also includes a load file in CSV format and a native file folder that contains all native files that were exported. But native files are replaced with redacted, with redacted PDFs if you selected the bottom here, replace redacted natives with converted PDFs. You also have an extracted text folder that contains all the extracted text files that were generated uh, during processing. And the final option is this condensed directory structure, which is much the same, except you can export it to an Azure storage blob. You'll just need to provide a shared access signature token for your storage account and a URL for the container to do the export. Thank you. I think that's all from my side. So um, I'm just going to share. Yeah, thanks, Adam. So yeah, I, I think uh, you can you can see from that there's quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of functionality provided. It'd be interesting, you know, and in, in, with reference to the question that people answered earlier about to what extent they were using Purview, uh, you know, whether it was re responding in response to standard or or indeed to premium. Clearly, quite a lot of additional functionality within premium, but. Uh, Given the, personally, I find a very complex understanding Microsoft licensing with no disrespect to, to Microsoft, but we've tried to summarize here the kind of the levels of license that are required in terms of achieving both standard and, and premium uh, purview um, functionality. So, of course, any and all of that can be discussed in, in, in detail with Cloud Essentials or, in, or indeed ourselves at Salient. So I won't dwell on that now, but uh, clearly an area we can discuss. And um, I wanted to bring it back briefly to sort of a, a sort of a benefits type discussion. So, um, you know, there, there are sort of three three areas that I'd like to focus on. The first being IT. So, you know, we're aware that IT teams are quite often put upon to go and perform particularly collections uh, and may not always be given the full context of what it is that's being collected and so on. So, you know, but by using the, uh, you know, the, the, the purview capabilities, um, you know, it allows uh, a lot of the, you know, the, the people who are asking for this stuff to self-serve functionally, you know, uh, essentially, and to be able to uh, reduce the amount of time and aggravation that IT have to spend chasing around collecting this stuff and probably a lot of to and from. Uh, the, the, the second part is really looking at the, the business users. So, you know, the legal folk, the risk, the compliance, HR teams, and probably other teams within the business. You know, it, it's, I think I mentioned earlier, this is the holy grail. It's the in-place collection of, of information, which allows you to sort of do early data assessment. You know, you saw Adam showing there how you can sort of review the volumes that have been collected. You can maybe, you know, refine those and so on and so forth. Um, but, but it's all done, and this is the really important bit, within the security and compliance boundaries of your environment, which is, you know, as I say, it, it is the holy grail. So, you know, enabling you to reduce the burden of, of duplicating data, enabling you to sort of, you know, cull volumes early on and not push them into the expensive downstream review processes and so on, you know, getting earlier feedback to the, to, to the matter and enabling you to sort of pivot and, and adjust your approach, perhaps just the custodians you're looking at, just be generally more agile. And, and by being more agile in the approach, you know, it's going to reduce the overall cost of any e-discovery activity, be it for an investigation or indeed for for litigation, so you know, it, it has to be a, a sensible approach to take. So, with that in mind, we've got a few sort of takeaways, and then we're going to get into a, a Q and A session. But the four takeaways that I wanted to identify were, were as, as shown on screen. So the first of all is you know, research what you've got, understand if you're sitting on this technology and familiarise yourself with it. It may be that there is a you know, there, there is a justification for supporting a, an uplift in your in your license. The second is is around training. So you know, we've given you a very high level view of what's possible within within Purview today. You know, Salient do run a, uh, a training course on this, and details of that will be provided later at the end of the, the webinar. So that's something you might want to consider. The, the, the third is kind of taking a, a cold hard look at your organisation and really its maturity in terms of dealing with any e-discovery event. Again, we as Salient we run short workshops on helping you self-assess and then you know having done that self-assessment you can sort of highlight areas where you may want to uh, to focus attention and, and finally you know getting on with it you know enough theory um de deploy this technology start using it for real um, and both ourselves and cloud essentials can support you in that 
So without further ado, I'm going to hand over back to Laura, who's going to uh, do a bit of a wrap up. Laura. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah, hopefully that's left everyone a little bit more um, confident, I suppose, in understanding of, of what you've got in your disposable um, disposal. And yeah, maybe some of those features that you aspire to adopt. Um, the, the scores obviously revealed that there's organisations here who are maybe looking to, to utilise the technology more. So yeah, just before we go into Q&A, um, David's already given a kind of nod to some of the ways that we can help you. So bigger picture around the, the kind of stack of, of purview um, functionalities, cloud essentials, um, deliver a range of services, sometimes very packaged uh, workshops or, or training services, um, other times playing much more of a longer term sort of advisory role, maybe working as an extension of your team to sort of fill fill some gaps um, around uh, yeah the specialist area of, of Microsoft capability, um, perhaps working with your compliance teams, governance teams, just just sort of join up that conversation between where, where policy and, and process kind of meets the technology. And yeah, as we with the last session where we looked at compliance manager, e-discovery is very similar in being a, a, a real kind of meeting point of, of those technical roles um, as they meet the kind of more, more legal compliance and governance roles. Um, so just to give you a, a, some examples of, of areas where we help organisations here, David mentioned sort of e-discovery training. Um, maybe you're looking at trialling some of the advanced capability uh, from Microsoft um, and we can help you do that in a bit more of a assisted way and, and play out some more, um, some really relevant use cases uh, direct to you and your environment and your your world as you kind of play with the, the technology and see um, and see if it's a good if it's a good fit. Um, maturity assessments around e-discovery, but also your compliance journey as a whole. Um, there are services from Microsoft that you can tap into um, that often we can um, we kind of look at funding options for as they, um, yeah, obviously want to showcase some of this technology to you and, and make it available to you to really kind of surface the benefits to your business. Um, so yeah, please do get in touch if you wanted to explore any of those areas and uh, yeah, we mentioned the next session will be around retention management and deletion. So again, tying in that theme of, of getting the house in order, um, which obviously serves the discovery as well. So I think that's, that's us. We're going to wrap up here.